The topic today is um, categorical predictors. I, I think uh, this week and next week um, contrast with one another. Um, this week are our um, features in data sets um, that are not numeric. So their attributes, their levels, their uh, even even the names of bins of data, you typically countable type data, uh, attributes like education level in a in a I don't know a people data set or uh, a zip code which looks like a number but but really is a category. Um, we'll get to text and breaking text up into. Um, countable categorical features, um, even attributes like a, a date, which might seem like a numeric feature, but, but we can extract from a date the, the attribute of the day of the week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for example. Colors, and, and really we could go on and on with um, uh, categorical attributes of our um, data set. Um, I guess in the learning objectives or in the header, um, right off the bat, um, uh, Max and uh, Kijel, um, they note that a large majority of machine learning models, when the book was written, and, and even more so today, um, to, to feed the machine learning model, the 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 recipe, the predictors have to be pre-processed into some sort of numer numeric format for the algorithm to work. So, so this chapter is about um, some of the feature engineering pre-processor type techniques available to make the categorical information um, Either, either into a numeric format for machine learning or even better to, to make those features uh, uh, useful predictors. Um, as an illustration of uh, a, a list of machine learning models, I actually pulled something out of a different book, uh, not our book, but in the appendix of the, the new uh, tidy modeling book. Uh, there's a nice little chart here and I've highlighted this, this column, um, the dummy preprocessor or the, the preprocessor that makes categories into dummies that we'll talk about in a moment uh, of, of all the machine learning models. Those, those with check marks require dummies or require numeric values. Uh, those with the little X's in this chart uh, random forest, naive bays in particular, and 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 up here these, uh, you know, decision tree based models. Um, we'll we'll talk in a moment about how they they could go either way. You could you could run them with dummies, or you could you could send them the categories as is, and and we'll cover why that that works. Um, back. We might even mention here the tree-based models naturally handle splitting because of the way they do um, the, their, their learning um, because they, they build in these uh, what amount to case when or if then statements. And the naive Bayes model uh, cross tabulates or it counts those category predictors and outcome classes. Um, last note here, uh, in our learning objectives is that, uh, uh, so the, uh, they, they could be, um, most of them are unordered. There's, there's not really an order between like a, a color or uh, 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 many, many types of category predictors don't, don't really get any meaning from, from their order, but um, we'll talk just briefly about um, those categorical features where order matters. Okay, so first up um, 
is, is this notion of creating dummy variables. Um, it, it turns out, or I've, I've recognized here that there's, there are different ways to, to um, take a single column of categories and uh, make a wide uh, uh, number of features, one for each category. <clears throat> um, in the example he, he describes, they talk about a uh, day of the week again, where um, you can take the seven possible values of day in the week and make a column for Monday and a column for Tuesday. And uh, in that Monday column, put in the number one for the Mondays and zero for any day that's not Monday. The mathematical fu function that uh, makes that translation, uh, they, they also use the, the word contrast. And we're actually measuring the, say, the contrast of Monday versus some, some baseline value. Uh, in fact, we'll get down here. There's, there's really two different ways that we're going to highlight. Uh, one is one hot predictors, and, and the other is the, the full array of seven predictors. Um, they actually describe here what, why you might only go with, in the case of days of the week, with uh, six dummy variables. Um, in a linear model or in a, in a model that's solved the way the linear model is, um, the, the seventh day can be inferred as the one that's, that's missing, that, 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 that doesn't have a column of ones and zeros. And your contrast, if if Sunday is your baseline, then you your your six dummy variables are Monday through Saturday with with columns of ones and zeros. Uh, there's a mathematical language here, but but it essentially says if the seventh is included, um, the linear model will fail. Uh, it it really needs to be n minus one columns to to compute with um with with uh, uh, the the basic linear model, the LM that uh, everybody's probably used. So less than full rank encodings are called one hot. And um, that there are situations though where rather than using one hot, you would keep all indicator variables. and and one example that that, benefits by having all the variables is, uh, you know, uh, Glimnet, where, where some portion of uh, lasso and, and ridge regression, or ridge regression would, would um, account for um, the, the, that, that overlap between the variables. Um, they mentioned here with the Chicago Transit um, example, that in a if if we were to do a linear model to predict ridership and use day of the week as a as a parameter, um, if if Sunday is your dummy that's that's missing, if you want one hot encode it, um, if if the average of Sunday ridership is is three thousand eight hundred people, um, the second model parameter then the Mondays uh, would be the, the incremental difference between Monday and Sunday. So the, the, the dummy variable represents the mean value above and beyond the, the, the reference cell value, or it could be interpreted that way, but really only for the linear model. Um, I put some code together here to make a, a table. This, this is, Instead of day of the week, this is the month. And um, if you're using um, tidy models and recipes, that one hot flag, so you can use step dummy. And when you set one hot equals, did I get this backwards? Well, when you set one hot equals to false. Oh, that's correct. Yeah. You get all twelve months, and, or, or you 
and 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 one of them is is zeros all the way across. And if you say one hot equals true, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there's the 12 months, but you only have 11 columns, 11 rows. So, so one hot is, is one thing to be mindful of when creating dummy variables. Uh, the next topic is what happens. This, this is uh, just really common when there are um, hundreds or even thousands of categories. It's, it's possible, like with zip codes, that creating dummies will make more columns than you have rows. And, and in most machine learning situations, that, that's also bad, that, that you can't um, you can't solve for that. You, you need fewer columns than rows. So, um, so the question is, what do you do? Um, one approach right off the top is to lump categories below a certain percentage into uh, an other category. Um, this is a graphic stolen off the internet of uh, say web browsers, and you'll see here in the gray, they've they've lumped all the smaller web browsers into into an other. And for for machine learning, that that helps some, so that when you you lump a other category and then do dummies, then you only get uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the other you you get uh, seven dummies. Um, another way to combine categories like zip codes is to use a hashing function. It behaves a little bit like, um, you know, mapping, in, you know, in, in the case above, all the small things go to other. Um, with hashing, which, which uses some elaborate math, you, you tell the preprocessor, um, how many, uh, uh, say, levels you want to end up with. Um, so you could start with zip codes with, with uh, thousands of categories, and, and you could tell it that you want to end up with uh, 16 or, or 32 hashes. And uh, computationally, there's a mapping that happens internally. Uh, between the category values and the and the hash value, um, this is deterministic. This this will take uh, some members of the of the category and combine them into different hashes. Um, this is unidirectional, and once the hash values are created, um, it's it's difficult to go back and forth to exactly what the original value on the you know, say in the zip code table was be because there are some collisions, I guess the, the word they use is collisions. Um, but this hashing is a, is a little more intelligent way of, of doing what we showed before with the lumping other, um, that there are different sorts of collisions created, um, but often, um, uh, you know, better gathering. Um, um, I guess it's hard to say. So the the collisions between uh, zip codes or groups are not not related in any meaningful way. There's some arbitrary or randomness to way the way they're joined. Um, but in a, in a preprocessor. In, in the hashing, if it's done enough, uh, it's possible to get, um, uh, uh, say, say better results or more, more uh, meaningful results than the, than the lumped categories above. Okay. 
novel categories. So uh, next point, when, uh, when we train a model, uh, we train on the categories we have. And if in the test set or new data, uh, sometime later, if, if in that new data, a uh, new category is introduced, in most cases, the uh, predictive model will fail. Um, there is a way to, uh, in, in tidy models recipes and in uh, you know, other algorithms to also introduce a step novel or a way to um, bucket any unseen new data into a novel category, which would have a like a, a contrast of zero. Um, conveniently, this, this approach also works with feature hashing. So you, you could get your novel feature hashed with, with all of your other categories. Um, another approach <clears throat> beyond dummies. So, uh, there is a way, uh, in fact, some, some very powerful ways to take your numeric categories, uh, excuse me, to take your, your uh, factors and make numeric categories, one or more numeric columns. Um, the first we'll talk about is um, uh, called likelihood encoding. It's um, a way of, of taking, um, again, zip codes or neighborhoods in the Ames housing data and arriving at a column of numbers. This training set or this, this likelihood encoding is, is essentially training a GLM model on the, uh, the feature neighborhood and, and for each neighborhood, coming up with a number that represents, a, 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 say, a medium value for, for, the, for the predictor and, and replacing the category with a column of numbers. Um, in fact, I did an example here that was different than Ames Housing. I actually went to the Star Wars data set. Um, so there, there is a data set with all of the Star Wars characters. Um, it includes, um, <laughs> you know, uh, Luke and Leia and, 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 and all the people in Star Wars and all the episodes. And, and in that sample data set, one of the categories is hair color. Apparently uh, like 18 of the Star Wars characters have brown hair color and 37 don't have hair at all. Um, there, so there, there are, or there would be 12 dummy levels if we were to try to predict, you know, uh, 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 I forget one of the other predictors might be height, you know, predict the height of the Star Wars character based on hair color. But um, rather than creating 12 dummies to, to predict height, um, we can use the embed package and put in the hair color and for, for the outcome, in this case, um, skin color, um, you can uh, make that hair color into a numeric feature. So, so this essentially is doing one machine learning model inside the preprocessor before it does say the other machine learning model on all of your features. Um, so this, this internal GLM model to make a numeric column is, uh, it is super fast. Um, and, and if you're fortunate, like, with, with hair color to have not many NAs and um, uh, you know maybe the 
the mean value of hair color has some relationship to skin color, maybe that's fine. But um, what happens when uh, the, the, the factor value you put in there has a single value, that, then it won't work. Um, in fact, this GLM model relies on log odds, but um, it, it um, usually ends up representing the middle of that category, the mean, and um, maybe the mean of that one or two. Um, so like blonde here, B-L-N-D-E-E, -E, <laughs> is, is just one item. So maybe that is an extreme value that really isn't representative. So it can be misleading. Um, so one way around the issue of your small count categories being extreme is to apply some kind of uh, shrinkage. Um, so instead of the GLM log odds model, you, you, you calculate the log odds and then you shrink those um, the, the, the magnitude of those predictors based on the size or the counts of, of that category. Uh, again, in tidy models and in the embed package, there's actually uh, uh, step blend code base. And um, well, in this case, I applied it to the, to the Titanic data set in the face, famous question, do you survive or not? Um, I do have a doubt about these, um, the, the, the shrinkage application and the way Bayes works that because it, I, I couldn't get it to work with more than two class outcomes, like, like we had up here where I was trying to predict uh, skin color with the multi-class, um, I couldn't get it to work, but I could get it to work with uh, survived or died. <laughs> um, so in, in this case, it's 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 a recipe. Um, again, we we took that categorical. Uh, uh, in this case, the Titanic class variable, and replaced class with a a uh, numeric value instead of dummies. Um, Uh, for another book on shrinking your um, uh, 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 you know these these numeric values based on the quantity of the category, uh, Dave Robinson has uh, his own really great book on how that's done. Um, so this this idea of of shrinking the effects or encoding those, um, uh, another idea that applies to both GLM and that Bayes method. Uh, it's a model on a model. It's, uh, it's almost like building in um, uh, uh, these, um, uh, I guess when you stack models and it's, it's almost guaranteed, guaranteed to overfit the training data. Um, the author, authors really insist that the best practice is to use uh, resampling even cross-validation folds and, and do it a whole bunch. Um, okay, so beyond the, 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 the GLM method for getting a new numeric feature and the Bayes method to apply shrinkage, um, there's, there's a third approach that uses um, deep learning pre-trained models. And when um, Feature engineering and selection was written. Some of these were new, but um, boy, there there are there are dozens of uh, off the shelf uh, pre trained deep learning embeddings that can be brought to um, especially text data. Now, um, I've applied or I've stolen uh, one of the Glove algorithms. In this case, it. Uh, uh, if you read the glove uh, uh, documentation, you can find how they trained that guy. And, and some caution should be uh, practiced because the source data sets that the embeddings were trained on have their own 
uh, internal biases, uh, and and they they should, of course, get credit for their work, um, but but they they do um, they do do massive dimension reduction. They can take these um, uh, uh, documents with thousands of words, and um, where where under a dummied situation, you get thousands of columns, um, which you can do by applying um, word embeddings in this case, is, is do a massive dimension reduction from thousands of columns to um, dozens or hundreds of numeric columns that uh, really estimate the semantic relationships say between words, the distance between words with similar themes. Um, these techniques go way beyond text data and language and, and there are realms with, with many other kinds of qualitative variables. So this, this idea of deep learning embeddings is a, is a really broad one beyond what's in, in our book. Um, as, as a fun example here though, I, I love, um, the show, the TV show, The Office, and and uh, not too long ago, the package um, Shroot uh, was pushed to CRAN. It's available with all of the dialogue from The Office, and um, I downloaded um, so the Glove Six B um, embeddings. Um, wh when it's downloaded to your computer, it's 822 megs. It's it's, it's pretty serious stuff. Um, but you can take um, the office data set. I just took uh, 10 uh, lines of, of uh, dialogue and, and select, uh, in fact, here's, here's the character that said the thing and, and an example of raw word embeddings. Um, oh, as this is the output of the recipe here, where I, uh, We'll talk about tokenizing in a moment, um, and and stem some of the words, but um, the word embeddings actually come in here, where where the uh, the glove embeddings are applied to the tokens, and the the tokens then are replaced with these numeric columns. So again, in place of thousands of sparse, very sparse dummy columns. With, with a lot of zeros, um, this new training set is exactly 100 feature dimensions because I used uh, Glove 6B at 100 dimensions. I guess, did, did, have you all used Glove? It's new, okay. Uh, um, if you've got space on your computer or uh, a cloud, resource, give this a try on, uh, I, I don't know, um, your, your favorite um, library and, uh, and, and check out, I, I think this, this really powerful way to uh, up your game on NLP, um, you know, predictive analytics. All right, encodings for ordered data. Um, I was a little confused here, but um, it turns out um, since the beginning of, I don't know, base R a long time ago that when you have a ordered factor, like low, medium, high, where there's some meaning between the factors, um, R looks at that and applies under the hood, these polynomial contrasts to, to numerically characterize the relationships. So it's, it's not like low to medium is the same, same distance as medium to high. They, they actually cascade that into, um, uh, say, several um, um, uh, co uh, combinations of contrasts. Um, a way to look at that, um, if you, if you set a values feature as low, medium, and high and make that an ordered factor, um, there's this model matrix uh, command from, from this book where um, you, you can see 
the intercepts and the coefficients that R assumes as the contrast between low, medium, and high. So when you fix a fit a model, it's it's assuming those contrasts in the model. Uh, does does the same. Uh, I, I think I got this from Emil uh, Heitveld. Um, same contrast. So it's important when you when you assume ordered makes your model better. Um, what what you're doing is you're getting polynomial contrasts, and that might or might not really relate the predictors to the response you're looking for. Um, in in some cases. Uh, well, polynomial contrast may let you down. So other alternatives, obviously, is, is to leave them unordered. Um, and, and then you, you take control of, of uh, either the embeddings or the, the GLM like we described before. Or um, if you're doing something like survey data, even though it's ordered, you may be able to uh, come up with an intelligent way to arrive at a, a single set of numeric scores based on other context, other things you know about um, like how the survey data was collected. Um, the authors really advise that simple visualizations and context specific expertise can be used to understand whether uh, these ordered factors are, you know, handling them are, are, are good ideas in, in, in one of these ways. Okay, text data. Ha. Um, so many problems in, uh, in, uh, in, in understanding um, either, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what people are likely to do, given some text um, from questionnaires, from magazine articles, from news, from tweets, from uh, product reviews, uh, from scraped web pages. There's just so many fantastic resources and text. Um, and and um, um, you know, the, the, the questions about what when that text would be good predictors of, of an outcome of the future. And um, there are a whole other really wonderful texts about processing and cleaning data. Um, one measure that they touch on in this book is, is to characterize the importance of keywords. So if, if, if you know people have a certain outcome, could, could you infer what, what keywords are most related with with certain outcomes, and and they 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 talk about um, and walk through an example of determining the odd, the odds ratios, which which just is a measure of association um, in either direction uh, for for the relationship with an outcome. Um, I stuck it here in the notes um, after. Um, Max's book. There's there's a whole different book on supervised machine learning for with text analysis with 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 gobs of other material. Um, in that other book, um, what's what's really common is is carefully scrutinizing whether stop words should be removed, and they're not the same in every language. You know, a, a, another aspect of this is that uh, uh, each uh, uh, linguistic framework handles stop words differently, and it may or may not be suitable to remove them. Um, same thing with stemming. Um, uh, the things happening in English with removing plurals or um, uh, say past tense and present perfect um, may or may not yield the results um, uh, the predictive results that are, are uh, required. So some consideration is required to, um, um, you know, whether stemming is done. And even this last point, uh, it, if, if you only have so much data, of, of course you have a you tendency to, uh, to use that 
filter to, to look at the most common words or tokens in this case. Um, and, and you might do that, um, again, to look for importance or, or uh, meaning in the data. Um, he mentions in the book, you also could calculate TFIDF, the term frequency, inverse document frequency. Uh, again, this, this helps tease out um, words uh, most associated um, so th that aren't necessarily common, but they are, in terms of this ratio, most associated with, with one outcome or another for each token. All right, so kind of back where we started at the beginning. Um, after doing all that, talk about dummy variables and um, uh, GLM and Bayes for, for getting numerical numbers and, and the glove encodings. And, um, you know, there's, there's BERT, there's, there's so many other uh, really great resources for doing encodings. They come full circle here to, oh, wait a minute. Um, um, decision trees don't care. They, they'll just take the category, categorical variable. Um, under the hood, a decision tree would just would would just split on your your day of week. You you don't you don't need to make dummies. If if you did make dummies and put it in the decision tree or the random forest, it's it's going to try to split on the dummy, uh, which when you think about it is is more complex. It's kind of overkill. Um, so the, the question posed in the book for decision trees and naive bays, does it matter? Do, is, is it okay just to put dummies in there anyway? And, and so they walk through a series of experiments. The, the outcome chart is a little bit of an eye chart, but the, the punchline really, at least for, for these problem sets, um, in the, in the German credit score and the customer churn and, and the attrition problem for, for the different kinds of random forests and cart and decision tree. The, the rock curves between the different encoding methods are almost identical, the, say the predictive power. So in terms of performance, it, it appears that whether it has dummies or not, doesn't matter there. On the other hand, the time to train the models is a whole lot more with dummies. It's slow. <laughs> so here, leave, leaving the factors as is and sticking them in the random forest um, actually saves you time. In their closing paragraph, they also note here, if you're looking at variable importance, um, from the VIP package or, or, or um, uh, other measures of explainability. So you, you wanna understand what, uh, you know, you wanna infer what caused that outcome. Uh, one thing to be mindful of is when you make dummies, the variable importance uh, is split everything out and, it, you may actually understand variable importance better by, by leaving them as, as categorical variables and not making dummies. Um, maybe another point to make here, if, if you use um, hashing, if you use um, like that GLM methods, um, you, you can't get variable importance anyway. There, it becomes a black box because there's no way to go back to the original uh, uh, categorical uh, level. So, in in many in many cases, if you want really good understanding of causal effects, uh, you can you can do pretty well with random forest, but you may want to stay in the in the original categories rather than making dummies. So um, I guess we're a little bit early, but uh, in closing, 
um, with the exception of tree-based models. Um, most everything needs to be made into a numeric. Um, of course, the simplest feature engineering technique is to convert each category to a, a dummy. Uh, some models require one fewer dummy than the number of categories to prevent the, the, the correlations. Uh, um, creating dummy predictors may often not be the most effective way, especially in, in like text where you'd end up with tens of thousands of columns. If, for example, the predictor has ordered categories, well, um, I shouldn't have written this. Polynomial contrast it is, isn't automatically going to capture the, the, the distance between the ordered categories. There, there may be something better. And finally, the, the body of text, all the text fields, when they're broken up into tokens, can be thought of as categorical predictors with contrasts and these techniques are available to convert them to numerics. And uh, that's all I had for chapter five. Is that, how'd, how'd I do? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, that was yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I've been working on this problem at work for the past month, so I really enjoyed this chapter. Um, we have a situation where we're working with small data sets and a client wants to put in a column with uh, a lot of categories, but they still want to be able to interpret the results, right? To have that variable importance piece. So I like try to do those other ones, the encoding and the hashing, but there's just no way to like really quantify importance. So ended up just going with one hot encoding. Yeah but it was really good to, to read how all of those different methods are kind of related to each other and when it's like the best place to use them, I guess, so to speak. But, um, I had a question about the ordinal, <clears throat> the ordinal factors. Like um, I haven't done much analysis like that, but, but I, the, the order of the fact, making makes makes some sense it's it low medium high or or some of those other things um and i've used a lot of that when we do like um in plant breeding you do scoring very similar yeah. to that low medium high big medium small those sorts of things are are very very common for scoring plants and um i didn't really understand the I, i've never used polynomial contrasts or anything like that but I guess it kind of makes sense that it tries to tries to use the order in which you give it to to make more inference from that variable. But I, I didn't quite understand, you know, your Jim, your explanation from the book was almost like there are better solutions there because you're like you may score low. You said you may score low medium as kind of one group and then high as another group. But that just sounded kind of like, well, it sounded like you were going to derive a make a feature from that by by grouping those those two groups separately and creating a new variable and getting rid of the old one which is what this um, book is about isn't it <laughs> feature engineering I, but your point is perfectly valid if you have domain knowledge like if you're in seed genetics then then you have an understanding of the relationship of the levels and so you can you could conjure up um, your own, uh, say, meanings of, you know, how detailed you want those relationships to be. Um, the one in my world that gets me into trouble is survey data and trying to ascertain whether a human said eight is different than a nine or a 10. Yeah. And, and that's hugely problematic because we humans don't think linearly. Um, we're, especially with emotional content. So I, I think you've got a tremendous advantage in, uh, in, in biology because you know you've, you've got other things to judge, you know, how that, how that can be handled. And um, you, you can bring in that outside knowledge to, you know, as professional to, to engineer something. Um, and, and, uh, I'm, I, I guess the point is just not to assume that 
polynomial takes care of every ordered factor situation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, um, so, so yeah, to be honest, in a lot of surveys, I'll make a cutoff and just take top box stores, mm -hmm. you know, put the nines and tens as the good guys and all other numbers as somebody that was angry and we need to follow up. And that seems to drive better business decisions, you know, in terms of market research and, and yeah. customer satisfaction. And so getting a number, um, it, you know, by, by bucketing them, I get a better, uh, 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 you know, something people are comfortable with. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard of that. I, we, we've done some sensory studies where we get consumer preference and yeah. those sorts of things. And you said it, you said it just a second ago, it was top box. There's bottom yeah. box as well. Like, yes, you can, you just, just, just different ways to bucket the data, right? That's right. So you're like so saying it's, the best versus not the best and then the, or the worst versus not the worst. Yes. And then those two buckets allow you to have a variable that's binary. Very simple. That yes, we try not to read then too much into, um, you know, whether someone's average is 7.2 or 7.5. If, if they were all under nine and 10, they're in the dissatisfied and mm -hmm. we got to do something. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think every domain, um, biology and medicine have their own approaches and engineering. Um, 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 yeah. Cool. I, uh, I, I like this chapter in that it's a, it's a sort of um, a survey introduction. Uh, but but there's we we go so much deeper into um, uh, local approaches to language, for example, uh, or or um, speech, you know, interpreting speech and and audio and and um, 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 yeah. So so this covers kind of the basics. Thanks. So I have a question. Um, I really, uh, I'm really interested in this step about making the model GLM model. The step that makes that makes the model. Yeah. So you can use that. Basically, what it does is the the estimate that begins the numbers are the estimate of the GLM model, isn't it? Yeah. So that that's a good solution as well. I so I use it a lot. I use it a lot, yeah. but I, I uh, like they mentioned there, it, it, you will overfit. <laughs> it, yeah. it is a stacked model. I mean, it, it doesn't look stacked, but um, it, it will absolutely overfit the tra training data. With, with a lot of categories, those, those numeric mm -hmm. numbers will, um, uh, will suffer when exposed to new test data. So, um, okay. A lot of cross validation is, uh, or or one of those um, uh, resampling approaches that, you know, it could be stratified, but a way of of testing that on unknown data. Um, uh, um, the uh, the the Bayesian approach um, is 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 really cool by by shrinking the coefficients mm -hmm. so the so the the your, your categories with fewer counts don't influence the results as much. Mm -hmm. That's it's a nice tool. Um, and for um, like what I've seen with survey data with customer surveys, you know, a couple hundred customer surveys, it it does a nice job of 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 keeping a couple of the outliers from influencing things too much. Um, yeah, so so that embed package, the add-on to tidy models is is handy that way. It's it's a good one. Okay. So um, yeah, I think um, uh, another suggestion would be to like order the um, by importance the variable to the, the category and then put an index. 
then it's it's a transformation of the of the variable then you can use that and compare that as in a matrix you compare the the numbers so you do not you don't have just zero and ones but you have a list like uh, an order at least uh, you can use them you can use this method when you you have uh, um, elements inside the vector that can be ordered yeah i i thought you know for example um i don't know if this is the case everywhere but like letter grades for exams for for you know for classes for work um sometimes some sort of numeric becomes a letter grade or a bin and and it is ordered and and if you understand the process for generating the bins maybe you can go back to an index and and infer a relationship or a distance between the bins and and if you can do that yeah um by all means but you would have some knowledge of the data generating process to say it's okay to make the distance from a C and a B and from a B to an A about the same. Um, and there's I, the, the ashes things as well. So could the, be, the, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can use the ashes substitutions. That, that will really encoding lots of different categorical variables then uh, it just stick a number uh, on, on them. And then you can compare the number, difference numbers. They are ordered somehow uh, or randomly assigned. So you can choose this option. So that, that would be, yeah, I just think it's, um, it's quite interesting if you've got many categories. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you so much, Jim. <laughs> You're welcome. So, My pleasure. See you all next week uh, with Eden with the next chapter, chapter six. That's right. So we encoding um, numeric predictors next time. So very interesting. So see you all next week. See you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. bye now. You.